I think so. Yeah. Are you ready for the first speaker? Yes. 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 Awesome. Excellent. Awesome. Well, without further ado, what I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Hayes uh, from Tiger Tiger. Mike, Mark is the uh, SEO analyst at Tiger Tiger, and he's got a proven track record of producing epic content that increases traffic and social share for his clients. Mark uh, is also the co-founder of uh, uh, Growth Devil, Growth Devil, co-founded Growth Devil, which has been mentioned uh, in the growth hacking articles in the Wired magazine and the Forbes magazine. Mark was also a member on the, the National Party's Innovation Board, as well as the Economic Board, which was chaired by Tim Grosser. And uh, he's, uh, he's got a, a, a wide range of clients, including the company like Script, which is a $6 million startup, and is helping that company uh, to, on a monthly basis to create content that is producing value for them. So I'd like to invite Mark onto the stage. Thanks. Clicker. On the table. Awesome. <laughs> Turn me off. <laughs> no. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming. So I'm obviously presenting today on how to build and operate a content marketing machine. So if we're just going into the start of this presentation, a question I get asked, oh, by the way, I'm also a pacer, so just realize that I'll be walking back and forth. Um, just happens to be the natural way I speak. So a question I get asked a lot is, Mark, what exactly is content marketing? And like Altoff and Winnie just said, it's about building epic content, great content, awesome content, the kind of content that people will share, the kind of content that people contact you because you're seen as a thought leader, an expert in your field. But I actually want to start this presentation off with a question which I want to ask the audience members. What is the average click-through rate on online advertising? Because a lot of people go, well, content marketing is all good and well, Mark, but I can go spend $3,000, $5,000 a month on Google AdWords and I can get around about 20, 30 sales. Actually, Juanita, can I get you up here to, to write the answers down? So I want to ask the audience, what do you think the click-through rate is? So, two percent? No, 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 the percentage. How many people actually click through? Yep. Four percent? How much? Two? two? Again? Someone from that table? Or those will start picking on someone. <laughs> One percent. Come on, keep on going. Nick? Okay, that's interesting. Andrew, what do you think it is? You think it's around about 0.5? That is a very optimistic man right there. The answer is 1%. 1% of people click through on online advertising, whether it's a Facebook ad, whether it's a Google ad, whether it's a LinkedIn ad, 1%. And that's not the people that actually buy your product. That's just the people that click that ad. Then you go down into another percentage of, like I think it works out around about 8% of people of that 1% actually will buy your product. Content marketing, on the other hand, which is very, very interesting, generates 300% more leads than traditional marketing. 300%. Now you can spend exactly the same amount of money as you would on a Google advertising campaign and get a far better result. And I'm actually going to start this presentation off with a case study. I know normally with these things you actually get towards the end of the presentation before you actually get to these. But I wanted to actually show you an example of a client that I've worked with and what the results were that they got from their one blog post. This is one blog post, by the way. He still just produced a second blog post the other day. On that one blog post, he drove 20,000 people in less than two weeks to his website. Over 575 people signed up for his email newsletter. He got 200 new signups for his product. He runs an email automation app. And he's based in New York City, by the way. 
He also got featured in the Moz.com newsletter. And Moz.com is a $50 million a year company who basically cater to most of the SEO industry. And the, every month they collect what they consider the top 10 best blog articles that they've read so far, and they push that out to, I think, something like 50,000 subscribers. He also, from that one blog post, got 718 social shares. Facebook likes, LinkedIn shares, tweets. He had the team from Buffer tweet him out. He also had Neil Patel tweet him out. But when we start also looking at what the long-term implications of that blog article were, he now drives 500 people a day through his website, a day from one blog article. He, on average, has asked to be interviewed by someone for a podcast, a blog article, a newspaper, every 2.1 days now as a result of that blog post. That's pretty cool for one blog post that took him roughly eight hours to write. And where we helped him was coaching him through on the title, and which we're gonna cover off later in today's presentation, also the story that he told because this is really, really important. The best blog posts and all the best content are the ones that tell a story. Oh, and from an SEO point of view, what's really cool is that everyone links to that article every three days. Um, so from a technical point of view, basically I think he's had 50 people from 50 different websites link to that one article, which is driving up like Google like crazy. But the important thing is before you start all this, what are your goals out of content marketing? Because there's no point in you guys starting a content marketing campaign unless you've got some goals around what you're going to be doing or what you're intending. So this is an example that I've come up with. By no means is this the default that you should be using, but it's just an example that I generally use for myself. So my main goal is obviously to generate leads. I want more business. But I'm also looking at some other factors. Am I increasing traffic to my website? Because remember, this is a long-term game here. This is, you're not in it for the short term. Content marketing does take time. You know, am I establishing myself as a thought leader? Uh, to give you guys an example, I posted a blog article two days ago. I've just been invited by onboardly.com, which is the PR company to most of the startups in the US, to be, do a guest post on their site as of this morning, as a result of that blog post. I've also been contacted by Vero, this morning, which is an Australian startup, they're gonna be tweeting out that article because I mentioned them in it. Am I capturing emails? Well, this morning I've ran about captured, I think, ran about 55 emails as a result of that blog post. Awesome, I can now market to those people to my heart's content. And social media, this is really important for me. Is this article being shared? Do people engaging with it? Good example is, like I said, with Marco and his startup client flow. 718 social shares. I published a blog post on content curation around about two months ago and I got over 100 organic social shares as a result of just simply writing a really good blog post and talking about and giving to the community. So there's five stages to content curation. But before that, I wanna ask another question. What should the average length of a blog post be? So I want to know what you guys think that the average word length of a blog post should be in order for it to be successful. Five hundred words? Anyone else? A hundred words. Three hundred? Well, you're in for a shock. Fifteen hundred words minimum. When everyone's done the studies, every successful blog post is between 1,500 to 5,000 words. In fact, when I do blog posts now, they're on average 5,000 words. People don't share nothing less than epic content. If you're looking for people to share your content, you have to build good content, in-depth content. And this is actually really interesting because I actually last year I had an interesting conversation with a marketing manager and she was criticizing me for doing 1,500 words. She said, you're too long. No one has time to read that, Mark. In fact, Google wants to see you writing 200 word blog posts. Well, one, the studies which were done by Moz and also done by Neil Patel completely disproved her. But as of Tuesday, 
Google ran another algorithm update, penalizing short content, effectively slapping down anyone that's done 200 to 400 word blog posts, pushing them right down the rankings. In fact, it also changed the way that it's described on Google now. There is now a section on Google called in-depth articles, and they're actually ranking it ahead of everyone else's articles. So they're actually pushing in-depth content to the top of Google and penalizing everyone else. Actually, I need a glass of water. Uh, <laughs> we have some technical issues. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's not working. We actually put batteries in that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. No Love you too. So before you start doing your content, you need to do your research. And this is something I have to drill into you guys. There is no point in you building content unless you know who you're talking to. You need to be looking at things like, where are they socially? And this is a mistake that I see everyone making. They think everyone's on Facebook, or everyone's on Twitter, or everyone's on Google+, Plus, or everyone's on LinkedIn. Some of your market will be on those social media channels. Some of them, but not all of them. So you need to just start determining which of the best social media channels that your market is living on. To give you guys an example, most of my market lives on LinkedIn and Twitter. They're not on Facebook for me. In fact, this is actually gonna be really interesting. Who can guess what my best performing social media channel is? Twitter's second. Google Plus is my best performing social media channel. In fact, every visitor that comes from me from Google Plus has a bounce rate on my site of 40%, which means 60% of the people that turn up stay. They, on average, spend seven minutes on my site. In comparison, Facebook, it's 15 seconds. Facebook is my worst channel. I guess I, that's why we don't have a Facebook page. We just don't even bother. But you also need to be looking at the demographics. Are they male? Are they female? Um, if you're someone like, I don't know, if you're a nutritionist here, you would be looking at what their income level is so you can start working out whether or not they're actually your target market. How old are they? Are they over 35? Are they younger? Because this is going to affect how you talk to them. You know, how I would approach someone in their 50s is completely different on how I talk to someone in their 20s. And I'll cover this later off when I cover to come to tone. But you need to be developing personas. And in fact, I've actually seen some really, really detailed personas that actually went into horrendous detail from everything from what brands of shirt they bought. So I'm guessing three wise men for Nick. Um, <laughs> where they drink, which bars they go to, what cars they drive, where they live. And to be fair, they're actually very, very, very accurate. You need to be also finding out who your audience's influencers are. So remember when I was talking about Marco from ClientFlow? We researched over 100 people that we would consider influencers in his particular space. We found out what channels they are on social media. We found out their newsletters. And we basically started having them build relationships with those people because the worst possible thing you can do is go, hey, share my content, without actually having a relationship to begin with. But you also need to look at where does your audience live? Are you necessarily marketing to New Zealand? I've actually got a really, really good story here um, I'm gonna bring up about not really understanding who your audience is. So we were working with a startup in the US and they wanted to take on Uber. Does everyone know who Uber are? Black cab company, uh, basically you order the taxi on your, uh, your app, sends it out to you, you catch the tab ride, it's basically, I think it's charged to your credit card from the app. Awesome. Their point of difference is they were going to be the Netflix version of Uber. 
For $250 a month, you could have unlimited cab rides within New York City. Unlimited. Now, there's some questions about that business model about whether it's sustainable, but we're not going to go into that. But who they thought their target market was were New Yorkers. That's, that's our target market. That's who's going to use this product. New Yorkers who are going to catch our cabs maybe once or twice a week to go to lunch with their friends. Who do you think their real target market was? Who were the people actually using their product? Bingo. Tourists. New Yorkers weren't using it. 90% of the users were tourists coming to New York City. $250 a month for a one-off product? Awesome. But here's the thing. All of their content was structured around New Yorkers, not tourists. So I'm having to go into a meeting with them saying, uh, this is who you think your market is, and this is your actual market. Unfortunately, they said, yeah, well, but we don't want to deal with a tourist market. We want to go after New Yorkers. So you can lead a horse to water. I've also got another question for you. Raise of hands, how many of you people here have interviewed your clients? Actually, that's more than I thought there would be. Before I started Tiger Tiger, I interviewed 50 people before I even launched the company because I was trying to find their pain points. What questions were they asking? What did they want me to answer in order for me to work out what content I should be building for them? But it also gives you an idea about what you could be charging price-wise, for example. And I know that Pete and Monique are going to touch on this later on. What is your company's voice? This is very, 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 very important. How are you going to speak to people? Are you going to talk in a conservative tone? Or are you going to be a little bit more you know, casual? I've actually got a rule with my writers, and it's called talk like a hipster. It's true. That's actually on the documents I send them. But what it's about is actually using informal language, the language that you'd find people would use naturally day to day. So for an example, we recently did a blog post where we said awesome source. We've used amaze balls. We've used all sorts of things. But it's about building content that sounds natural and how they would speak with their friends if they were out one night. Because what we've found is content that is boring does not get shared. Content that is ultra conservative, depending on what you market, will not necessarily appeal to someone in their 20s. So this is actually a small section of the tools that I use day to day, which I'm just going to run you guys through. And these are some of the tools and websites that you should be using. Who here is on Quora? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Shame on the rest of you. <laughs> Quora is a Q&A site. You can ask a question, and here's the great thing. You can actually have influencers actually answer you back. Someone wanted to get hold of a venture capitalist in the States. It was really interesting. He just posted up, what's this guy's email address? And actually had the guy directly reply to him. Here it is. <laughs> But more than that, you can actually answer people's questions and drive it back to your content. It's a tactic that I use every day. I find out a question being ans asked. I find out, has there been an answer that is satisfactory at this point? If not, I then go and build a blog post around it and say, here you go, I wrote out the answer for you. I get a ridiculous amount of upvotes because of that. I also get people following me on Quora now as a result of that. But this is also how I develop some of my blog posts, all my content, infographics, my webinars, my everything that I'm looking to build because I'm looking at what questions people are asking. Another tool I use is BuzzSumo. BuzzSumo is an interesting tool and it tells you how, uh, how much a particular piece of content is being shared. So for example, if we were doing content marketing and I entered that keyword in, it would print out a list for me of all the top performing content marketing pieces of content and how often it was shared. So I can start looking at, is this actually even worth me going after before I even start? Mention is very similar to Google Alert. It allows you to sort of track people talking on the net about certain topics. So I use it to sort of monitor the words to see if there's actually any buzz happening around at that time. And in a similar way, hashtag.org is what I use for doing research on Twitter about finding about whether or not a certain hashtag is being used enough. So I might find out, for example, that uh, a good example is hashtag measure. It gets around about 30 to 40 actual mentions a day. So Maybe I shouldn't be using that. Maybe I should be using hashtag analytics, which gets 500 a day. So this is for when I'm actually putting content up on Twitter that I'm making sure that I'm actually putting the correct hashtag that's going to get the most maximum exposure.
Buzzstream is a tool I use for outreach. What it allows me to do is go onto a website and rip out the contact details for the person I need to be talking to. So I can basically find out the direct email address of the CEO if I need to, or the marketing manager. I can find out all their social media accounts, or their personal Twitter accounts. So I can start putting together a profile about who I need to be approaching. I can start building notes about what other publications they might be involved in. The next two, Trello and Evernote, are probably the most important tools that I use. Anyone here use Trello? Andrew? Trello is a product ma project management tool. It basically works like a giant pin board. So what I use it for is basically starting to build out what my ideas for my content are. What do I want to talk about? What do I want to build? Do I want to build an infographic? And then I use Evernote to start my research process and I start with clipping various articles or research that I come across. I'll skip over Topsy because it's pretty much uh, very similar to um, another Twitter research tool for finding influencers. Keyword Eye though is interesting. It's around about $20 a month, but what it allows me to find out is the volume of searches around a particular topic. What I'm generally looking for when I'm doing my research is to find out that there's at least around about a minimum of 1,000 people a month searching for that particular topic. Because then, remember, we're investing money into building this content, so there's no point in me spending $2,000 building a piece of content if only 10 people in the world search for it. How am I doing for time? Next stage, the hard bit, ideas. Like Juanita and Altoff were just recently mentioning, the big problem is content is not just blogging. Yes, blogging is by a good start, but let's look at all the other forms of content you can be producing. And by the way, this is only like, I think, one quarter of my list. Research data, infographics. I actually don't see very many New Zealand companies producing infographics, which I'm really surprised with. One of the best infographics I saw from a digital agency was they said how to deal with a troll. It was awesome, it was funny, but it was also relevant for social media. It got them a ridiculous amount of social shares. I think like three and a half thousand social shares. Easy to produce, it's graphical, and people love visual content, by the way. If you can produce visual content, by all means do so. Are you establishing yourself as a thought leader? Knowledge bases. So many people don't do knowledge bases these days. If you've got a product, and you can do a knowledge base for it, that's good content if you're answering a simple question. In fact, use something like user voice where people can actually ask you the questions directly and you can respond to them and build it into your actual knowledge base. Guides are a big one. If you want actually a really good example of a company doing some of this stuff, Kissmetrics. They produce, I think, around about one guide a month and one infographic a month. And they drive a ridiculous amount. In fact, actually, I'll give you a good example. Kissmetrics when they first started, just produced infographics for 12 months solid and drove 2.5 million people through their site from that alone. 2.5 million from producing infographics. They produce things like guides, like, you know, the beginner's guide to social media, the beginner's guide to content marketing. White papers. Something I did at Growth Devil is I actually wrote three white papers before we even got started and actually got them onto a number of sites because it was helping me establish myself as an actual thought leader in that particular area. Webinars. This is a really, really good one. I mean, you've got a captive audience for one hour and you're presenting to them. But also think about recording those webinars and then putting them on demand on your website so that you can just keep on using that content over and over and over again. Templates. If I was a business development manager, why not build out a template and put it up online and say, look here, you can download it in exchange for your email address, or you can tweet it out for me, or you can share it and actually get that. I know of a real estate company in the US. They publish a quarterly report and send it out to all the journalists, and it gets them a ridiculous amount of traffic and leads because they're saying this is the state of the real estate industry in New York, this is the average cost of homes, this is what sales were, and it's used as a reference guide. Ebooks, which I'll actually come to later, I'll give you a good example. Um, I was recently been working with Squirrel, mortgage brokers. One of the things I said to them recently was, why aren't there mortgage calculators on your website? You know, you think that you're a mortgage broker, the first thing you do is build out a, an actual calculator. PowerPoint presentations like this one, you can upload onto SlideShare. 
Um, and working with a charity at the moment was really interesting. Like we've had 88 views in less than a day on just that one PowerPoint presentation of theirs. Interviews, now this is something you can use over and over and over again. Go and actually ask for an interview with someone, a, a leader in your industry. Do the interview on Skype and record it. That then becomes something you can upload to YouTube or Wistia, so you've got video content. Have the interview transcribed, that's a blog post. Rip the audio from it, that becomes a podcast. All of a sudden, you've got three pieces of content for the price of one. Blogging, which I've covered off. Stories. If you've got a brand and you've got awesome stories or case studies, why aren't you telling people about it? Let them know all your successes. Let them know your clients and what they're able to achieve as a result of your business. So production, this is something that you need to basically work out whether or not it's worth, do you have the internal resources to do it yourself? I mean, if you've got a graphic designer in-house, awesome. If you've got people that could write, even better. But if you don't, then you really need to start asking yourself some questions of, maybe we need to start looking at working with some people that actually already have these resources. But when you're producing your content, you really need to be planning out your content at least six months in advance. Because you need to be working out, are you building up to this piece of content? Are you gonna be sharing articles on this particular topic leading up to it? You also need the time to put together the actual research, you need the time to write out the content, to get it designed. I can tell you right now, you're not gonna produce an infographic in one day. There's just no way it's gonna happen. Same thing like, I've got one blog post, it took us three months to produce. And you'll see why. You also have to set responsibilities. Like I was saying, if you're doing this internally, you need to be working out who's gonna be doing the research, who's gonna be finding the photos, who's gonna be doing the graphic design. Um, you know, who's gonna be on social media tweeting this out, who's gonna be building the influencer relationships during the course of it. This is a team effort, and mm -hmm. if you ever speak, by the way, your mouth goes really, really dry. <laughs> Especially when you've been speaking for, I've got 19 minutes left, awesome. Remember when I was saying how it took me three months to build out of a blog post? I can tell you why, because we had to do draft, then we have to do edit, then we have to do second draft, then we have to do the final version. And when you're working with a writer, there's a lot of backwards and forwards on that. You're having to give them feedback, you're having to explain why something didn't work. I rejected 90% of the article of one of my writers. I just said, look, I'm sorry, this is just not gonna work, this is unacceptable. So that meant they had to go back and spend another two weeks rewriting it. That was second edit. Then we have to go into second draft. Then I have to go back and provide them even more feedback. So this is a long production cycle. This is not something you just churn out. And I think, remember what I was saying about earlier about producing 1,500 words minimum? It's because you're not churning out something very quickly. Repurposing content. This is something that we're gonna to touch on later today. But a good example is that, like I was mentioning about that Skype interview and being able to use that as a podcast and being able to use that as a video example. If your particular blog post or a piece, particular piece of content is done very well, you can recycle it. If you've got a blog post that does well, turn it into a PowerPoint presentation. Or, in our case, we turned it into an ebook, which we've actually just only finished this last week. But this was a blog post that we did, and it drove over 4,000 people to our website and ran about, what was it, 36 hours? That's pretty cool. Did well. Got around about 100 social shares, like I was saying. So we said, okay, could we make it even cooler? Could we go and provide some graphs? And so we actually spent some time with our graphic designer and actually turned it into an ebook. And then uh, we've been submitting it to sites like Scribed um, and other ebook sites and actually publishing it because this is actually helping drive people again back to our site because everyone's reading it and going, hang on, this is quite cool. Who are the people that produce this? Now, this is interesting outreach. Where so many companies go wrong, and I've seen this so many times in New Zealand, is they publish their content and that's it. Oh, it didn't do well. Well, hang on, did you actually go out and talk to people about this piece of content? You know, you spent 40 hours producing it, and you spent, what, 10 minutes? Oh, well, we shared it on Twitter. <laughs> uh, 
So did you actually reach out to influencers in your area? Did you go, hey, look, I've mentioned you in this blog post? But before that, like I was saying before, you need to be building these relationships with these people. Um, for example, I was dealing with a guy in the US at the moment by the name of Justin Jackson. He runs a site. I'm slowly building a relationship with him over time. We're chatting back and forth as a result of his email newsletters. He follows me on Twitter. If I see something interesting from him on Twitter, I interact with him. If he sends me a newsletter with a call to action, I answer it. He actually asked me yesterday, what was the best piece of advice you ever got in his newsletter? And I said, being told to shut up. Actually, that's a true story. My mentor told me, you talk too much, shut up. And he was right, because I was talking too much in meetings and I wasn't listening to the client. So like I was saying, you need to be building these relationships, and these relationships are going to take time. I would say if you've got a piece of content that's going to be going out in June, then round about in January, February, you should be starting to actually start working with these influencers. You should start following them on Twitter, retweeting them, answering their tweets, see if you can connect with them on their newsletter. If they've got a call to action, like I was saying, answer it. Start interacting with them, start talking with them. Um, I sometimes comment on their blogs, and like I was saying yesterday when I went to Onboardly, I said, hey, hi from New Zealand, you know, friendly. And look, you know, we, we've chatted on Twitter a couple of times, I've made a couple of comments on your blog, you know, here's an article where I've mentioned you. Send it to them, and Heather and the other CEO came back and said, that's really awesome, Mark, thank you so much, we're going to tweet this out to our followers right now. Then they invited me this morning saying, hey, you know what, we've been chatting a lot, why don't you actually write a guest post on our blog? I think that they get roughly around about 100,000 people a month through their website. So that's some good exposure for me. And it's an example about something that you guys can be doing as well. Ah, thinking about other channels. So this is where you need to start thinking not just about social media, but all the other channels you can be placing your content onto. So like I was saying, if you've got Scribd um, or Account, put your eBooks up there. If you've got PowerPoint presentations, go on SlideShare. Um, you need to be thinking about all the different channels you could potentially be distributing your content through, not just, oh, we're gonna put it up on Twitter and Facebook. You know, think about publishing, like, for example, a blog post on LinkedIn if you're one of the, I think, Juanita, you've been invited, haven't you? One of the LinkedIn publishers that you can actually publish now. But don't be recycling content for that one. I say write something actually custom for that particular. So the final stage is analysis. Now this is basically how did your content perform? And you need to be setting some goals around this. But fun fact, chief marketing officers report that they spent 8% of their marketing budgets on marketing analytics. And they're expecting to increase this level in the next three years. Now you've got a lot of analytics platforms out there. You've got Google Analytics, which is free. You've got Kissmetrics. You've got Crazy Egg. Um, one that I used to use was Mixpanel. So you've got plenty of different analytics platforms, and by the way, you'll find out some really interesting stuff about how your content's performing. Crazy Egg, for example, is a heat map analytics platform. It allows you to actually see how people's eyes are tracking through your content, finding hot spots and cold spots, and that will tell you how engaged they are with your content, where they get bored, and where they start going off. Sites like Mixpanel and Kissmetrics, on the other hand, will tell you how someone actually goes through and engages with your content over time. You know, you can use, some, use something like Trackio and actually find out how engaged the customer was before they actually ended up buying from you. However, if you don't already have Google Analytics installed, do it now. You should be, at the very least, installing Google Analytics. I check my Google Analytics account every day, and I'm looking at things like bounce rate, how engaged were they with my content, you know, how, how basically, what channels bounced, funny enough. Some channels perform better than the others. For example, StumbleUpon is my worst performing channel, 99% bounce rate, so I know not to even bother sharing on something like that. And like I said, when I was trying to find out what my best performing social media channel with Google Plus was, that's where I found it. I can also find what sites are sending me traffic. How long are they spending on my traffic? How many pages do they read? So that starts telling me about, and I'll, you can also track what article they arrived at, and how they flow through your website as well. So that gives you some really good information about, you know, should I be putting up a call to action to download my ebook at this particular junction? Should I have a, ha a pop-up offer? 
you know, I also ask myself a question, is traffic increasing? You know, the worst thing you can do is, you know, and Jay will cover this off in keywords, but so many people obsess about, I rank number one for this keyword. Yeah, that's great, but if that word isn't bringing you any traffic, it doesn't mean anything. So I try and encourage clients to look at ultimately, is your traffic going up over a period of time? You're gonna have times when your traffic drops because it's December and everyone goes away for Christmas break. Or it could be that's Thanksgiving, or it could be something else. Going back to social media, I also look at how much was this content shared on social media. That's a big driver for me. I'm trying to find out, you know, was it shared on Twitter? What, how much was it shared on Twitter? Was it shared on Facebook? You know, how many likes did I drive as a result of it? I'm always trying to one-up myself by getting more and more and more social shares. So that's a goal that I set for myself to try and get more social shares. I think I'm just coming up to my 10 minutes for Q&A. So, questions? My name is Kevin Smith from New Zealand Fashion Tech. We're at um, Tertiary Educational Institute. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, lots of quite different um, clients. Yes. We have um, school-aged children, mm -hmm. um, our potential students. Mm -hmm. We have professional people, potential students. We have um, industry. Um, then we have the educational. So um, do we we have to develop communication um, channels and styles and, and platforms for each one of those. Yes, and this is something I did, not similar, but a, a client had developed an app to teach people to read. Some of their market were children, some of their market were the Hispanic community, because obviously they'd moved and they were wanting to learn English. Some of them were adults that basically had never really learned to read. So for each one, we had to build an individual <laughs> persona around how we were gonna reach out to those people. So in your case, you should be looking at building different personas for each one and working out what's the best way to approach them. So for example, you might find that an infographic works better for the children in that particular segment, but you might find that writing a detailed ebook might work better for your adult segment, just as an example. Oh, come on. Mark, I'm, I'm still puzzled with this um, 1,500 minimum uh, worth documents. Yep. Uh, now we have a website, and we're using videos yes. to get the message across. Now, does that is that counterproductive? Being no, no. Um, Jay will probably cover the this off in his presentation, but video can work very, very, very well as far as content is concerned. You're putting that up on YouTube or with Steer? Yeah. yeah. YouTube, so if you're producing video content, I'd really encourage you to be putting it up on YouTube. Um, Google changed their guidelines with video production and they're rewarding YouTube now more than they are rewarding sites like Wistia and Vimeo. So they own the platform so they can rig the game. But, uh, but, but the content is actually the video. Yes. So how does Google regard that? Is that, uh, are you being punished? Then? Go for it. Cool. Um, hi there, I'm Jay. I, I will speak later about SEO. For video content, what I would do um, I couldn't agree with Mark more about the high-end content, um, and you absolutely have to have a, at least a large number of 1,500 word articles um, in order just to give yourself some authority. So that's absolutely important. When it comes to video, there's a, there's a couple of tricks which you can do around SEO for the video. The first thing is make sure that you stuff your, there's a lot of, kind of the, the actually I'll just stand up. Um, there's a there's there's a lot of um, space to write uh, content in the about the video section, um, so you, you can put a lot of keywords in there and write about what your what your video is about. The the other trick that I would definitely do is when you post that on your blog post, have a clear transcription. Um, Nick's going to talk about reusing yep. the content. Um, yeah. I would get I would get some PAs to. Uh, tr I'm a bit lazy, so when I do a video, I'd much rather have someone else type it out. Um, one trick you can do with YouTube, which is 
uh, it actually caused a the Chinese government uh, it caused a diplomatic um, little bit of a situation where the New Zealand Prime Minister was speaking, I think it might have even been in Parliament, and the translation on Google Translate from YouTube was a little bit funny, and, it's, and instead, it, I can't remember the exact wording, but it basically made it sound like we thought that the Chinese were um, not really cool in any way. <laughs> so um, it, it actually made the front page of the Herald, which I found quite amusing, that a, like a machine translation could cause a dip diplomatic problem. Um, but what the trick you can do is once you get the video, you've got the content, they have a, a bit of a messy transcription, but you can download that whole transcription. It's on the little cog on the, on the video on YouTube. And then you can re retype that up. That will be indexed, all the keywords from that will be indexed. But I also extract that and chuck that at the bottom of the blog post. Yeah, so to talk about what Jay was saying earlier, a really good example of this is if you look at that Moz site that I was talking about earlier, the founder of the company, Rand Fishkin, he does what he calls Whiteboard Friday every Friday. He speaks in front of a whiteboard, he talks about his ideas, but you'll notice that below the video is a transcription about everything he says, which probably equals 1,500 to 5,000 words, depending on how much is going on about the particular topic. So those videos work very, very well. Kia ora, kia ora everybody. I'm, I'm Monique Bradley and um, I work in film and television. Um, when it comes to, just as a little heads up, think of video as a way to engage the people, but b Google can't see video. It's the keywords that are in behind your script that you use in your video. Hence, it's incredibly important to have a transcription done because that's how Google can read what's going on in your video. Just to add on, thank you guys. I think it's really powerful stuff. Sorry, I actually hate the word powerful. <laughs> My old boss used to use the word powerful for everything. It pissed me off to no end. Because he'd be like, this is very powerful. And I'd be like, Justin, would you shut up? <laughs> Can't stand that word anymore. Yep. Nope. Crazy egg? Yes, uh, heat mapping. The, the website where you can heat map your website. Is that, am I saying it correctly? Thank you. Yep. Uh, I might be spelling this wrong, but it's called crazy egg. So yep, should be able to find it, no problem. If not, I'll catch up with me and during the break and I'll, I'll talk to you. Any other questions? Uh, you've spent a lot of time on the analysis and um, looking at the numbers, which we highly recommend you do. Uh, do you spend a lot of time on that? Does that take up a, quite a portion of the time you, you engage with social media? Um, I will generally spend around about an hour a day w looking at it. So if you think about all the other time, uh, out of an eight hour day, at least an hour of my day is looking at the analysis. Um, but I don't just use Google Analytics, I use other tools like CoSchedule to look at basically how often the article was shared. I will look at things like Follow a Wonk to see what influencers shared it. If I'm on Google Plus, I'll try and look for ripples to try and find out whether or not the article you know, had a ripple effect and was shared by other people and what was the cause of it. So yeah, you know, I, I generally, an hour would be about how much I'm spending on it. That table, ask me a question. <laughs> so, um, you said um, normal click through rates about, oh, it's a bit of speaking of analytics. Yep. You mentioned um, the normal click through rates 1%, but mm -hmm. social um, marketing is. That content marketing. Uh, sorry, content marketing. Uh, can increase at 300%. Mm. So you're saying there's like a 300% kind of click-through rate for? Well, what I'm saying is that um, content marketing has a 300% more likelihood of generating you a, a potential sale okay. versus 1% of a click-through rate, and then, what, maybe 10% of that 1% actually purchasing that product. So to give you an example, if you, what you see with a process of someone that's going through a content marketing cycle is, you know, how many people sign up for HubSpot here or um, sites like Kissmetrics or anything like that? So you download the ebook, and you start opting into the funnel. Then they say, hey, look, here's an infographic. And over time, you're building trust with that person. 
and that person's getting more engaged with your brand. Maybe they sign up for your email newsletter that you send out every two weeks, and again, you're building that trust. And so what you'll find is that rather than just an online ad that just dumps them through to either the homepage, which is what most New Zealand companies do, where they should be really sending them through to a landing page, but even then, the landing page has got a good chance of failure, is you put them through a cycle of building trust and building your authority with them, so that when, like I do, at the moment I'm about to sign up for Salesforce, Salesforce have built a huge amount of trust with me over like a three month period with, here's our white paper, here's our ebook, here's our webinar. So over time I'm going, hang on, this is a company that I wanna deal with, I don't actually don't mind that they're gonna charge me around about $300 a month. I'm actually willing to spend that money because they've shown me the benefits over a period of time and what I'm gonna get out. I'm actually getting a return on investment. So that's the thing that I'm starting to see is like, if I was a nutritionist, I would actually be doing it from the point of view of actually sharing some real positive stories of I was 500 pounds and now I'm 250 pounds because you know what? This person was actually able to show me how to actually eat properly, how to actually do exercise, you know. A good example um, might be the guy from fat to fit to fit to fat to fit. You know about this guy? Does anyone know about this person? He was a personal trainer. He deliberately made himself obese in order to show people that they could lose weight no matter if they actually were obese. But along the way, he became a better personal trainer because he actually realized losing weight is hard. Before, he'd be, up, he'd be to clients going, why can't you just lose weight? It's easy, just hit the machine, eat right. But because he actually made himself obese, he realized that things like sugar are hugely addictive. And he was actually finding that he was relapsing, even though he's a personal trainer. He knows everything to do to get in shape. It took him a year to get back into shape. He thought he was gonna do it in two months. But he built trust with his potential clients by actually blogging about it. He got people to sign up for the newsletter, then he built a book. So now obviously he has people going, look, hey, I wanna train with you. Because obviously you know your stuff. And you know what I've been through as far as a journey is concerned, going back to a story. You know what I've been through. <coughs> oh. I've got one more question. I'm Rizbe from Excel Corporation. I work with Altaf. Mark, you said content, uh, you need to plan it six months in advance. Uh, but if I'm writing about a current trop topic, trending topic, yep. so how do I? Well, that's called newsjacking. Um, that's a technical term for it. Okay. Um, newsjacking. Like hijacking. Like hijacking, but you're hijacking a news article. Um, so you're, it's called newsjacking. It's where you're talking about a, a current topic. That, is different because that you can pump out quite quickly, provided you've actually got a good, competent writer on staff or that you know someone that you know. Like, hey, uh, so for example, if I, if I was in the New Zealand Herald and I was basically talking about obviously this dirty politics thing that happened recently, you might be writing an article about that book and seizing the moment, and that's going to help you with ranking Google because Google is going to rank that content because it's actually relevant at that particular time. But that's not what I call evergreen or cornerstone content. That content will drop off the moment that article no longer becomes relevant. So it's only good for a very short period of time, maybe two weeks, and after that, you're not gonna really see anything as a result of that. What I'm talking about producing with content is long-term content, content that should still be relevant a year down the track, two years down the track. That's what we call evergreen content. Um, obviously, things change, you know, so 10 years from now, we might find that Facebook is a dead social network, in which case, all your articles you're writing about Facebook are gonna just be antiques. Right. Now, if you do have any other questions, there is going to be a panel discussion later on today. So please write the questions down and do ask them in the panel discussion. You'll have time. And you might think of something as you go along um, to ask Mark later on in the panel discussion. Mark, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much. <coughs>